As I said, thank you all for joining us this afternoon at the Richmond Art Center. We're delighted to have the two fabulous exhibitions, David Park, Personal Perspectives, and the companion exhibition that we're sitting in the midst of all this wonderful work, The Human Spirit, Contemporary Configuration as an Expression of Humanism. Um, we're so honored today to have two wonderful and thoughtful art critics and writers and curators here with us today. And um, I would like to first introduce DeWitt Chang. DeWitt is a painter whose work has been exhibited widely, including the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art, the Oakland Museum, the Inferno Gallery in Oakland. He has a degree in art history and has taught an open and exploratory approach to criticism and he has taught for UC Extension. He has written and been published in many art publications. Here's a, a short list. Art Week, Art News, Artillery, California Printmaker, Slurry Magazine, San Francisco Art Magazine. His exhibition, essays, and artist profiles have made deep contributions to galleries and museums publications. He is committed to working with Bay Area art, and DeWitt Chang gives background and context, the tools for understanding, and his reviews are so important and essential to our entire art community. Thank you for being with us today, DeWitt. John Zaraval is Assistant Professor of International Studies and Program Chair of European Studies at the University of San Francisco. John Zarabel came to California from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where his curatorial focus had included Edvard Munch and Edouard Manet, contributing catalog essays to Munch's Mermaid, Manet and the Sea, and Courbet and Modern Language. Professor Zarabel has also published in Berkeley Review of Latin American Studies. He's the author of the book Empire of Landscape, which examines the intersection of colonial politics and landscape art in 19th century France. Many of us know John Zarabel as a curator of contemporary art. He held the position of assistant curator of painting and sculpture at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where he curated Frida Kahlo and brought Carrie James Marshall into the atrium. As a contributor to Art Practical, Zarabel presents an analytical approach to contemporary art practice. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. So, um, there are some questions that interest me particularly with this exhibition um, that I've been working with. And the one that is foremost for me is that when we consider how David Park was active in the art community, he was teaching at the California College of Fine Arts, which is now the San Francisco Art Institute. He was showing his work. He was, um, he was engaged, as engaged as you could be in the art scene of the moment. And in that language of abstract expressionism, David Park stepped back and he made a radical switch. He made a change and returned to figuration. And I would really love to hear, when I mean, we're looking back now at a decision made 70 years ago, just about 70 years ago, and how we understand how radical that choice was. And I was wondering if, if both either of you in turn could um, sort of give us your sense of what meaning that held at that time for him. Okay, great. There we go. Hello. All right. Um, okay, I'll go first. Um, I'm a Zarabelle, so I'm used to being last, but I'll try being first this time. Um, the, uh, you know, I actually first discovered David Park um, when I was an undergraduate and studying um, art. I was a painter. And uh, we were spending a lot of time in the studio in those days doing exactly what David Park did, you know, painting. You know, people take off their clothes, you paint them, right? Um, and uh, Park's work struck me as so phenomenal because it bridged the divide between abstraction and figuration, right? Um, many of the teachers that I had were simply abstract painters, like 
bar none. Um, and they, you know, educated at Yale in this particular generation. And, and um, abstraction was where they expected us to go as artists. And I, I felt very strongly about, um, you know, dealing with the world that you could see. And uh, so I was looking for a way to bridge that divide. And, and for me, Park was that. So as I became an art historian, I learned much more about the context for figuration and for abstraction, and, and particularly the relationship between, you know, the, the WPA, um, which was really where so many artists were, um, you know, being employed in the 1930s, and then what came afterward, right, which was a, a big split or a divide, you know, a way of breaking from that tradition to create something entirely new, um, something that would, you know, put American art on the map. And I think that, in, in a way, um, Park's, you know, in, you know, his relationship to that, which was really unfolding here. I mean, we have Mark Rothko and Clifford Still teaching at SFAI in the 1940s. Um, that's unfolding right here in the Bay Area. And, and for him uh, to s go back to figurative art in the midst of that huge leap forward, right? Um, but not be returning to the WPA, not be returning to the kind of inherently social dimension that art was given um, in that you know, particular historical context, um, but trying to find a language of his own. That, that's what I identified with the most. And, and it does seem to me uh, a very brave move, um, but also one which, you know, in his own comments on it, there's snippets and quotes from him and whatnot, but the, you know, focusing on, on the real world that we could all see is kind of meaningful if you're an artist. And, and um, it, it's, it's, it may be radical, but it's also really sensible, so. All right, yeah, I agree. Um, because we live in a, a sort of pluralistic art world today, we, we tend to forget how much pressure there was on artists in the 40s and 50s because of, of Clement Greenberg's theories of, of the linear development of art, which of course were transposed from the political sphere into, into the aesthetic sphere, and how much pressure there was on artists to, to go abstract. Um, Sir, uh, uh, Florence Rubenfeld's biography cites one artist, I can't remember who it was, who said, I felt that Clement Greenberg was trying to kill me, <laughs> literally. Uh, so yes, it was a big deal for, for David Park to, to become a traitor just as it was for uh, Philip Guston similarly later on. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, Park, of course, you know, uh, was famous for having thrown away all his abstract paint, you know, thrown in the dump, uh, because he felt they were the work of uh, a painter who wanted to be important. And as a very humble but dedicated guy, this was antithetical to his self-image. Uh, not, of course, the self-image of a lot of Abex painters uh, of the time, however. Um, so. It was a big deal. It was, uh, uh, he did lose the friendship of, uh, uh, or he was estranged, let's say, from a lot of fellow painters for, for a while before they finally came around. Uh, Diebenkorn, I believe, saw in a mag, he was in New Mexico at the time. This is from a book and from the interview with the daughter, which is very good. I, you watch that if you, if you missed it. Um, Diebenkorn thought that, that, that Park had lost his mind <laughs> I mean, it's analogous to people calling Augustine a traitor uh, 15 years later on. So, uh, of course, today we don't, we don't care about that, that, that particular battle, just as we no longer care about the battle of, between the drawing and, and the color people in, in the Romantic era, uh, classical era. Um, and we have complete freedom, uh, which is um, wonderful, but at the same time, um, coming in to see this show and the Park Show, <coughs> which shares uh, an interest in the human figure and, and treats it in the most exacting and challenging and exciting way, uh, makes us realize that for every freedom you lose something too. So uh, I, I, I think this is, um, this is a marvelous show. Uh, I'm. Um, uh, I remember that, that Helen Park uh, said her father um, described his own weakness as making paintings that were lugubrious. Doesn't bother me at all. Uh, he, he, he had friendly criticism for 
of his friends, Elmer Bischoff, who he found occasionally too sentimental, and of um, Richard Diebenkorn for being sometimes overly theoretical. But um, those are all actually, um, they're pretty minor failings in work as ambitious as those three uh, were, were up to. Thank you, Joanne. Um, you know, I, I think since you've brought up um, his cohort, Diebenkorn and Bischoff, um, that's, that's another thing that I have been thinking about for a long time, you know, for, um, for quite a while. This phenomenon that Park not only made this personal decision for himself, but that he was able to um, bring Bischoff into the studio and draw from the model. And then um, when Diebenkorn got back into the Bay Area in, in Berkeley uh, and saw what they were doing, you know, eventually he started drawing with them also. And um, in the archives of American art, we hear the oral history that Diebenkorn gave. And he said, essentially, you know, he felt outnumbered <laughs> and, and, and joined in and, and started to see that there was something there for him also. Um, but what I find so astonishing is that, you know, after a decade, we see that Park has passed away, he's died, and then we see a few years later that Diebenkorn has gone back to abstraction. We see Bischoff has gone back to abstraction. Hassel Smith has gone back to abstraction. Frank Lobdell has gone back to abstraction. So all of those who had gathered around him and who were close friends and working together had this period, and then they stepped out of it again. And this is a question that's kind of been buzzing around for me for a long time, and maybe um, you have some thoughts on this. Um, hmm. um, I took a look, a quick look at, at Thomas Albright's book on the uh, the Bay Area artists of '45 through '80, and he talks about the atmosphere uh, during the Clifford Still era at SFA. I, of course, uh, called the California School of Fine Arts at the time. And still, um, well, he talks about these, uh, Albright talks about these two um, kind of competing initiatives in, in art. One is to, to, to use the, uh, the Greenbergian word, to push the envelope, to, to develop the new, to develop a new vision, to develop a new way of making art, a way of seeing art. Um, and then the other one is, is to, uh, to communicate with people, to, to, and not necessarily art people, uh, to to create community to create communication. Um, there's a there's a wonderful uh, story, and I and I presume this is true. If Tom Albright said so, that uh, when Still was at SFAI, he <coughs> he secreted himself into this sort of vault-like concrete studio at the base of the tower, and he would occasionally invite um, student privileged students to come in, and you could not in, and apparently you know you could see all the way up. So it was. This, this wonderful metaphor for, um, I, I mean, working under sort of the pressure of history and in the unknown, uh, whereas uh, Park, who was, you know, never even considered himself, he didn't like the word artist. Uh, he considered himself a painter, and so he had a much more humble, down-to-earth, and, and, and maybe um, communitarian point of view, a, uh, I think that from, uh, in, I remember from Nancy Boas's book that he disliked the park kind of um, a radical monk pose and so he favored a more sort of ordinary, ordinary uh, working Joe uh, identity, which I think is also true of the West Coast painters. John, did you want to? Um, so, yeah, um, Park never wore a monocle, right? <laughs> Let alone a cape. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm fascinated about this detail that that you know, after Park passes, they go back to they go back to abstraction. Um, the reason that I'm fascinated with it is, you know. We so often in art history talk about art schools, right? The Expressionist school, the Impressionist school, um, the you know the New York school is what the Abstract Expressionists were called. But you know, notwithstanding, we had them here too. Um, the 
you know, in some ways, Park was a charismatic enough figure to have had a, a school kind of form around him, right? And, and, it, and it was, I think, you know, on one hand, um, you know, he had this wry sense of humor, he didn't play himself up, but also I think he was really brave and that people were attracted, other artists were attracted to that. Um, that he um, just saw things the way he saw them and he wasn't trying to constantly prove himself in some court of public opinion somewhere, whether it was, you know, uh, Clement Greenberg or, or any other critic. Um, and, and so in some ways that allowed a lot of artists to experiment in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and then after he's gone, it kind of dissipates, right? So what is it that makes an art movement come together? And, and, um, and it just seems like such a fragile thing, right? If, if it can come and go so quickly um, uh, and, and maybe not even make it to the history books. Luckily, we have Albright um, and a variety of other authors who've been writing on California. Um, you know, painters of the mid 20th century that have given us so much information um, about that period. But, um, you know, as far as an art history, like modern and contemporary art history class, it would be a blip, right? And, and so, in some sense, that, um, that, that's something that I'm very curious about. Like, how does a school get going? What happens? And then how does it come undone? I, I want to just, like, go back to... Um, the work during the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. And essentially that work was really um, not new or inventive. It, the regionalism was um, accepted and embraced throughout the country. But when Park goes back to the figure, he is doing incredibly radical things with the figure, with the picture plane. He is highly abstracting his um, use of light and dark and, and visual rhyming to punctuate um, the, the image is extraordinary. The perspectives that he takes on, the pushing to the edges and um, the high, high horizon, the head almost disappearing. We don't see that kind of development in Bischoff when he's working figuratively. We don't see that in um, Fletcher uh, in in, um, in Frank Labdell. We don't see it in, in Haskell Smith when he's working. Um, so, I mean, I, I question a lot, like where could this have gone? What could he have done? But the innovation and the, the real brilliance in what he's doing all the time is quite extraordinary. And here's my question. Do we see that being picked up and carried on in the next generation? Who would you consider the next generation? Um, well, I think second generation would be maybe, you know, Bischoff's students, like um, Joan Brown is in this exhibition. Um, so Joan Brown and, and Terrace and John, you know, going on, where, where do we see yeah, everything? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I would, uh, I, I think that, um, I mean, not to address your question directly, but uh, I think that in the, in the immediate post-war period, there was this terrific um, urge in all the American arts to create an uh, American identity, and that, that involved, certainly for in New York, a rejection of, let's say, European surrealism at the time, which was seen to be a kind of dandified European art. So, hence, you get the Pollock phenomenon and, and, and sort of the, the, uh, the American artist as worker rather than, you know, a dandy in a velvet jacket. Um, but by... Five ten years later, uh, we have the beginnings of of, a, of an art world. And it's you know, and it's basically the triumph of the American uh, abex style. And so I think that uh, these artists were were then free to to they were free of that pressure to look back to Picasso, Matisse, uh, Leger. Those those are some people that whose influence I think I see in Park, um, <clears throat> and. Um, and to, to carry on that tradition while having, you know, gone through the phase of ABEX and, and learned certain things about composition, color, shape, and, and so on, those certain freedoms that they brought to that that the French painters had not, uh, had not used. Not, not, that's not a judgment against them at all. 
Um, and so I think you know the later later generations build on that too, uh, and and grab the new freedoms that emerge with every generation. So I I, I don't think that um, uh, figured art art is ever going going away, but it just goes in and out of style. And uh, and abstraction and figuration I think really do feed each other. Yeah, I'm you know in terms of the next generation, I, yeah, I would say certainly Joan Brown is one of the central figures who develops a whole other level of experimentation, which I think plays off then into um, other artists who are still working today, like Squeak Conrad or some, someone like that, right? Um, but I also see it um, uh, in West Coast terms, ending up somewhat closer to pop art, right? So a, a figure like Wayne Tebow, um, in some sense, is um, picking up on some of those figurative elements, uh, albeit in a different way, and then turning them into something else. And that ends up getting read as pop art in relationship to, once again, things happening in New York. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I see this as an, uh, a kind of alternative, figurative California painting that's seeking to um, develop new territory um, and that finds, you know, it, another language. It's not like David Park, but there is a lot of um, physicality. Um, there's a lot of compositional play. Um, and, uh, you know, Joan Brown particularly pushes the terms of figuration and the way in which the figure is rendered. Um, so we, I, I do think we see that, uh, that exploration continuing, but in pretty different terms. I have a question um, for both of you. As as critics, when you step back and look at work, um, how are you affected or not affected? How do you relate to work which is perhaps engaged by the most contemporary concerns, be it um, social practice, installation, um, digital work, versus um, you know straight painting just for painting's sake? Or how, how do you um, calibrate? You want to go first? <laughs> I'll, I'll go on that one. Um, I, I I have a lot of mixed feelings about the contemporary art world, um, but I I do think you know painting has died and, and come back so many times now in terms of trends and all that. But I I have a pretty blanket statement about this, which will sound a little off kilter, perhaps, but I'm going to make it anyway. Um, which is that painting is really about pleasure. And a lot of the social practice art and the new installation and uh, kind of work that's being done in a broader realm, both for biennials, also for museum exhibitions, but um, often to make a big impact. It's, it's not about pleasure, it's about impact. It's about creating a, a sensation in the viewer, um, which is not one of enjoyment, but one of a kind of awe or, um, you know, um, amazement, right? Um, uh, and, and therefore, it actually is aiming at, at completely different things. And sometimes, you know, with social practice, there's direct social intervention that's being, being um, offered as an alternative, right? But in the end, I think painting, um, uh, there's something about visual pleasure that just doesn't ever go away. Right? And so even in the sort of David Hockney retrospective, and you saw the ways in which he's using film and other new technologies, it's all pretty much about painting, right? Um, whereas other artists using other, those techniques to make other kinds of work uh, really are, are much more, I don't know, earnest or, or um, uh, you know, laboring certain kinds of issues, right? Whereas, as, you know, painting just is itself. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's true. I think uh, one of my problems with um, <clears throat> a certain amount of contemporary art is I think that it's, uh, that it's excessively driven by theory. And of course, that was uh, Park's friendly criticism of Diebenkorn at, sometimes. Um, that that the, the theory, which, I mean, which is often a, a kind of sociopolitical uh, idea, is... is is enlisted as the rationale for the work. And because there are no rules about medium or, I mean, because all these barriers have broken down, artists can really do anything they want in terms of multimedia, in terms of combining media, in terms of bringing the backstory of the creation of the artwork into, into the artwork in terms, in fact, in performance, making it 
the, the work itself. So um, I think for, for traditional art people like, art object people like me, this is always a challenge to, uh, to not kind of, you know, tut tut it. It's not, it's not uh, what was it? The, Leo Steinberg once, once cited somebody, uh, a, a painter looking at uh, Picasso's uh, Demoiselle d'Avignon and, and, and saying, it's all uh, pitch and toe or something like that. It's not the kind of painting we're used to. And I think that can be the trap of someone who is, you know, has a traditional orientation. Uh, the other, the opposite is true, of course, then that you become overly seduced by spectacle and sensationalism, or sensation or sensationalism, uh, if you don't have a certain kind of expectation or knowledge about what it is that you like or don't like. And a lot of art comes down to basically personal taste. So this is the one reason, I mean, I'm when I was an art history student and, I, and it's like, it's almost, well, it's, it's almost gospel to me. I love reading about artists and love tracing to the extent that I see it, uh, ideas that recur in, in history generation after generation. And maybe, I'm, maybe it's um, seeing it where it doesn't exist sometimes, but um, I think that if art, if contemporary art is always about the new and exciting um, and we don't have some kind of historical grounding, we don't have some, you know, we don't have an allegiance to Goya or Velasquez or Picasso or whoever it is, then you kind of fall into the trap of being the slave of uh, fashion, entertainment. So, um, I'm, I'm, thinking about um, a couple of names that you um, brought forward um, earlier, uh, Picasso, Matisse. Um, when, when Park was 19 and he was working with Ralph, Ralph Stackpole um, in San Francisco, um, there was a visitor to San Francisco and a large banquet was arranged for this artist coming from Europe and the young David Park was able to attend and there he met Matisse. So he had this early connection with Matisse. He certainly, like everyone else in America, was thinking about Picasso. I mean, I think it's impossible to look at anyone working in that period and not see that they're thinking about Picasso. But when Park um, is in his, you know, fabulous decade of incredible painting uh, with the figure, he has moved forward. His work is not derivative in any way of either of them in, in that period. It, um, it, it builds and moves forward. So um, my question is, um, where do you as um, analysts, interpreters, and um, critics of, of art see where Influence and reference is important, and where not being derivative and being original, I mean, moving in a different direction, even if it's in, in, in ways of reconstructing elements that already exist, how do you um, approach and judge work that way? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... Uh, difficult. Okay, so, you know, there's the famous story about Gorky who copies the style of Cezanne and then Picasso and then he finally develops his own style. And it's, you know, the sort of very earliest, one of the very earliest forms of American, what we would now call American abstract expressionism, right? And, and, and in some sense that is a kind of norm that we understand and, is, and accept, right? Art students copy other artists in order to learn how to be original, right? Unfortunately for most people, art students copy other artists in order to learn how to copy other artists. Um, and, you know, uh, that's, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of smart alecky comments that artists have made about this over the years, but the, the bottom line is, you're going to have that sort of weight of history on you when you're an artist, and you're going to see things that you think are interesting, right? And, and for me, it seems like it's not really a question of um, uh, 
the originality isn't in reference to past art. The originality is in reference to the way in which you see the world. And, and so therefore, in some ways, um, uh, it, there's people who are good at copying past artists and people who are bad at copying past artists, right? And it's not because of the way they look at art. It's because of the way they look at life. Yeah, um, Corky's famous comment was, if, if Picasso drips, I drip. And he copied Picasso's for something like 10 years. I mean, there's that's an extreme example of, of artistic hero worship. Um, and, you know, uh, of course, Corky had a terrible life then. But um, um, a lot of artists, of course, of, of Corky's generation felt trapped by Picasso. They felt that he had done everything. Uh, de, Kooning, de Kooning, I think, said that bastard, he did everything. Um, and he did. So this is why um, that, the, that American artists had to break out of the European style of art, art making, which was based on, based on drawing, basically, other than, uh, well, let's, 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 let's ignore de Kooning for the moment. Um, uh, I happen to think that, uh, that drawing is, is an important skill to, for artists to learn, no matter what, no matter what they end up doing. If they end up working in performance, if they end up working in social relations art, I think drawing is important. Um, it teaches you how to see, and that's, that's, and, and, I, and, I, and I distinguish knowing how to see from how to read, read texts, which, is, which seems to me to have an inordinately important um, role in today's art world. Um, in my opinion, <coughs> art theory having replaced art history, and, and I think it's, I think, in, I mean, I'm clearly an art history advocate. Um, so um, I think that, uh, you know, if you copy Picasso, you're going to learn something. And uh, if you never get beyond copying Picasso, well, you're not going to do it forever, probably. Uh, you're going to do something else. So I don't think that being afraid of these guys is a good is is the way to go. I think you 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 work through them, you work around them, you you and you figure out where you stand in relation to them. And of course, you're not going to just take Picasso. You're going to take some other people too. Um, so I, I I think that that in America, <laughs> I wouldn't say this in China, but I would say that in America we have too much of a sort of a uh, cult of originality that's supposed to be inborn with us. Uh, orig our, orig our individualism, individuality, is assumed to inhere in us from birth, and I, I don't think that's true. I think you develop your individuality, um, and you develop your way of seeing, and your, and your craft, uh, and through confronting the masters. Um, trying to think of a good quotation, I can't come up with one, but also being part of the uh, artistic milieu of the time, which is going to shape you also. Uh, plus materials. Materials change, media change, all that's going to change. So there is no way you're not going to be part of your time if you're alive and sentient and thinking. Thank you. Um, so we've kind of looked at the figure and the form of the figure taken on. But um, Park also um, had a very strong conceptual approach to um, painting, to um, creating these images, to structuring them, his compositions. They're, they're, they're highly, highly um, contrived and, and structured and, and balanced and worked up. Um, and they always are at the service of the content, his content of um, the relationship between two people, man and nature, um, adult and child. I mean, these, these themes, um, the music, the musicians and their musical instruments in unison, um, th these, these are always what he puts his um, conceptualization to at the, you know, it's, it's at service. So um, would you either both, one after the other, <laughs> together, talk a little bit about this kind of conceptual drive in painting and, um, and, and being able to realize those kinds of contents?
Well, I'll take it just because uh, just because it's it's a fair trade. Uh, I'm. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure that I would call him um, conceptual in the way that we use the term nowadays, which means driven by non-visual ideas to a large extent. I think he was very much an observer, and, uh, and of course, I think he had um, that, that apprenticeship, or, or at least, yeah, I, th I think he had, had done some kind of apprenticeship to the modern masters. I can see it in his in his drawings. I can see the Picasso there, uh, the Leger, and maybe even the Matisse. Uh, so, um, so to the, if, 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 a, if a sort of affinity for certain masters in art history, well, I suppose you could call it conceptual, but I think it's, it's very different from what we're, the way we use it today, which is um, Duchampian. Uh, yeah. Um, I I agree with DeWitt on that one. It, the, the conceptual is kind of a code word at this point. But I, I also see what you're trying to get at, Jan, that there's something about his painting which is very um, clunky, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, with Matisse, you think about the, just the incredible elegance of line and everything he did um, just looks so, um, you know, uh, perfect in, in, in the way in which the different dimensions are set up. He just had this kind of character of being able to do that, whereas Park is, is not. And, and, um, and so in some sense, he's working this over. And you can see him working this over. Um, you can see it in, the, in many of the you know, ink drawings um, that he did in the studio, you know, the quick studio shots, right? Um, doing these ink drawings and being like, okay, let's try to make a, a big, thick line and see if that will actually um, work, right? It's the shadow that he sees in the figure, but will it work to actually delineate the figure, you know? And then we'll, we'll try to, you know, we'll put a foot in there so that you sort of get a stop, right? But, but in some sense, he's working with these visual elements which he's taking apart and putting back together um, and playing with and experimenting with. And so that's, I think, what makes his painting um, in some sense really original to us is that rather than really um, model himself on a kind of mastery or uh, elegance a sense of, um, you know, um, bringing it all together. Um, he shows us how he's working through these problems um, and painting one color on top of another and breaking up the composition in a different way um, to see if he can do that. Like, it's almost like, you know, can I get away with this? Um, if I make, you know, the horizon line that far up or if I, you know, have the, the you know, the, the main figure that close to the surface of the painting, um, will it actually work? And, um, and that's kind of exciting because every painting feels like um, he doesn't know if it's going to resolve. Um, not, not just how it's going to resolve, but if it's going to resolve. Um, and so that, that, that leaves us with a, a sense, I think, that Park has really uh, worked through a problem with this. And that, that's definitely different from, from conceptual art as we understand it. Okay, so I have to say <laughs> that I think when he, um, when he has a large figure with its back to us, he is making a statement. I mean, he's, he's determining how we relate, what access we have to the scene, to the figure, to what's going on. I think these are deliberate conceptualizations of what he's going to do with that picture. And um, if you see him with the, um, the jazz band at the Art Institute, and you see just this long, long ear along the edge that's, <laughs> that's there. I mean, he's making decisions and then he's making paintings to allow those points to be made. In fact, I think these things are determining the painting, and in that sense, I would consider them, um, you know, yes, it's, it's not Duchampian, but it is a conceptual approach um, to which everything else follows, and it has, it has meaning, and it gives, con you know, the, the meaning of the painting, that content, is in part how it is structured, and it derives that meaning from how it's structured. Um, Um, well, so um, let me just ask you as, as um, historians and curators how you approach um, the figure and, and the presence of the figure in contemporary work. I get to go first this time. Um, so 
the, you know, it, it's interesting coming and looking at this exhibition and thinking about it as a figurative exhibition um, because there's a lot of different kinds of work. There's photography as well as, you know, drawing and painting. Um, there's work, uh, you know, which just features hair, for example. Um, there's a lot of different versions of figuration here. And so, in some sense, while the, um, the question of um, rendering the figure and making the figure meaningful in a contemporary context um, is one that is still somewhat hovering here, um, I think that the figure has started to take on um, different meanings in different ways. Um, and so in some ways we would have to think of the figure as um, an image or symbol for something um, within that's being deployed within art, right? So in Park's time, um, it was a raging debate. Now it's not so much of a raging debate. So what does it mean you know, to move back and forth from figurative to abstract, right? Um, uh, in, in a sense, um, that question is being also collapsed by the, the conceptual one that, that DeWitt brought up in the last point, that you know, so much of art needs to have, um, you know, so much of the art that's being made today needs to have this kind of um, thread that you can pull and that will reveal the uh, nature or the, the intent of the work, right? Um, I sometimes think about it like a mystery novel. There has to be a gotcha at the end, right? Um, and, and that that is, um, as with a mystery novel, a highly artificial construction, right? Whereas when you see the figure in a work, it's sort of indicating to you that we're supposed to be relating, this to, relating to this in a bodily way, right? And, and that's true even if you don't see the figure in the work. And I'm thinking about, you know, sort of Bruce Nauman's corridors or cages or things. Um, that there's a, there's a kind of physicality that that brings forward uh, or an awareness of our physicality which is very um, essential, right? So an artist like Gata Amer who uses figurative um, imagery by sewing into a, a piece of fabric um, brings a sense of physicality back to her work um, even though it's in a highly conceptualized structure um, that's you know, filtered through a you know, global contemporary arts. You know, it's got all this stuff about you know Muslim culture for a North African woman making this work for the Western audience and all that sort of thing. But there's still something which is really still um, uh, bodily um, uh, that's that's present in, in that work. And that's in some sense what I get most out of figurative work. I, I watched a, a, a documentary about um, Chinese culture recently, and, and then <laughs> I don't remember the name of the artist, but he was around the 11th century, and he was uh, 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 counted to have been a revolutionary in that uh, his the spare style of the calligraphy forced you to look at the the breaststroke and gesture as the conveyors of emotion and feeling in the work, which is of course the whole idea between, behind abstract expressionism. So in ABEX, and, and of course this kind of gets abused sometimes, uh, the, the, the artist's feeling in making the, the stroke or the, the drip or the whatever uh, becomes legible to the viewer uh, as, as conveying emotion, uh, the emotion of the painter. And I, I don't, and I think that in a lot of, of, of Con more contemporary conceptual work, the emotion comes from um, maybe non-visual factors. Uh, let's say the the I mean we talked about the you talked about the puzzle aspect of it. There's a certain puzzle aspect to a lot of concept conceptual work because you don't really understand what it is until you understand the frame of reference of the artist, the various sources that he or she is drawing on and that the way they have come together. So, um, you know, uh, you do have to read them, read about them, because it's not self-evident as in, well, traditional painting, let's say, uh, even, even Abex painting. Um, so I would say that that, that directness of gesture and, and maybe linked to John's notion of, of the paint imparting pleasure 
or the, the, the totality of the pain and parking pleasure is no longer so much of a factor, I would say. I'm just wondering if there are questions from the audience, if um, we could open this up, if you have some questions to ask of John or DeWitt. I think the figure is, it's like a vehicle for expressing yourself. You can use it as a replica of the figure, like when you do a realistic painting or life drawing, but you can also use that figure to evoke totally like the things you're speaking of, the things you can evoke in abstract painting. Um, but I think that for me, there has to be some type of emotion or conceptuality that comes across. And it just seems to come that way. I'm not contriving it. But maybe I need to do that more, be more contriving. <laughs> uh, yeah, John talked about the idea of unpacking or decoding a work. and. Um, and of course, th this is true. I mean, uh, uh, and, and but that was true also of, let's say, the Victorian painting of uh, of two hundred years ago, uh, Ophelia lying in in the pool of flowers. We know the story behind that. We know we're supposed to react to it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, the Western civilization had this sort of common frame of reference: the Iliad and the Bible, and Milton, uh, which uh, which of course is, is completely different nowadays. Right. So. Um, and, oh, no, and also, um, artists, I think, are, are, are freer to explore more, you know, uh, obscure personal areas of interest. That's true. So. Um, I just wonder, though, um, how do you feel about the figure today in art? Do you feel it's, it's, it's a valid means of expression? Or uh, it will never it? not be, I think. Um, I mean, in, in some sense, right, the, what DeWitt was talking about was a, um, a kind of literary or narrative-based tradition, right? And just as if we look at Renaissance painting, it's the Bible, right? It's like, okay, I learned my religion through art history, basically. <laughs> um, so in some sense, it, there is that. But the, the question, of course, becomes, uh, in today's world, what is the narrative? Um, so, what can we say um, about a figure? Uh, and, and in some sense, that, that'll be something that we say personally, right? As opposed to something which is kind of universal, as the Bible was thought to be by those Renaissance artists. Um, and, and so, in some ways, um, it becomes much more uh, subjective, or um, uh, at least... Um, the narrative that we bring to that may not necessarily be the narrative that the artist had thought of, right? And I think that what makes a picture powerful is that um, it's adaptable, right? So that we can, you know, they say about Shakespeare that it was, you know, if you were super literate and you knew all of your Virgil, then it was great theater. And if you, you know, couldn't read and, you know, could barely afford to, you know, take the floor seats, it was still great theater, right? So in some sense, that's the, the same thing I think about figurative painting today. It's that it's um, that what makes it great painting is that it, it is applicable, that people can find their narrative in there, um, even if it's not being given from on high. I just, I just want to point to two works in the exhibition. Um, the one is Juan Carlos Quintana's um, painting of a skull with a cigarette, and the other is next to it, and that's Charles Garabedian's painting. So again, if you don't know the Iliad and you don't know about sacrifice, you look at that painting and you still can figure the narrative. And you can look, you don't necessarily know that um, that Van Gogh painted a skull with a cigarette, you know, grinning at you. But you have all of that contained in the marks, in the scratching, in the layering, and you have a whole lot of um, expression in, in the choices of the, the skull, the decapitated um, character. I'd like to return to the, one of the first questions, which was talking about why um, why figurations sort of disappeared from the works of some of these this cohort, and I find for me it's just that you, the answer is in what you said about um, Park. He learned something from doing using the figure. He 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 grew through using what was around him. And I think the other guys didn't because they're in different natures. Um, didn't so much. It seems like a lot of Dwayne was he was really landscape. 
you know, even, even when he was abstract. Um, Bischoff, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't looked at him enough, but um, there's a lot of feeling in him. It's like, it's maybe that was what that was about, the feelings, <laughs> the sentiment. Part, part as Gordon called him, him sen uh, his, his weakness, sentimentality, right. because there's a theatrical aspect to Bischoff. Sometimes they look like loosely painted hoppers. Uh. Excuse me. Peter Seltz has also been asked why in his um, exhibition at MoMA he included Diebenhorn and Oliveira and not Bischoff. And he's made the same comment that it was too sentimental and too charged with you know, the personal and the emotional. You mentioned that after Park died, the School of Figuration fell apart. I wondered if that might have been because they never received the seal of approval from the all-important New York critics. And let's face it, they were probably fairly, um, uh, you know, they wanted to make it in the art scene. And for a long time, the West Coast art and artists were considered far too provincial to be important. <laughs> Plus I change. Um, the, <laughs> the, you know, it, it, it is, uh, of course, um, you know, art history is a narrative, and as we know, history is written by the victors. So, um, in, in some sense, yeah, it, it is a New York um, critical establishment. It, but it's also true that, um, you know, real... Uh, that there's something about a school that, that is about the interaction of individuals, right? So if you think about another school that formed just after this in San Francisco, right, around Bruce Conner, um, that, um, that dynamic um, uh, kept going despite not being, you know, um, authorized or uh, approved or appreciated by the sort of East Coast art establishment. Um, you know, and uh, now I think, uh, finally Bruce Conner died, I think um, that makes it a lot easier to do museum retrospectives because he was apparently not the easiest person to work with. Um, but, you know, uh, so many other um, uh, artists are starting to get their due um, from that generation. And, but, but you can see that the school survived with the people still there, even though people moved through. Um, uh, it seems like it kept going. And with Park, it did seem to sort of Poof. Yeah. I just like to point out that in 1955, um, although Park had been showing some of his figurative paintings already, it was in 1955 that the Richmond Art Center did a solo exhibition of his figurative work right here in this gallery. And <laughs> yes, and it was the it was the first major figurative exhibition of the time. It was reviewed in the newspapers, and also. In the last years of Park's life, he was teaching at UC Berkeley. He had a gallery in New York. He was showing and selling his work. And, um, you know, they, they, they worked professionally in that sense that they knew exactly where they wanted their work to be. You know, David Korn certainly, you know, he, he, he showed in New York and, um, and then after that in London. And, um, you know, it was, they were very careful about how their work was seen, very determined. So I, I just have a question about, um, you know, you were making a comment about current figurative work as being um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, something that is pleasurable. And, uh, and, and, and I'm thinking about painting and figurative painting um, in the process of mark making as part of painting um, and that 
that is sort of an aspect of the humanity of, of, of making art. Whereas conceptual art uh, doesn't quite have that same visceral, always, uh, connection to the work. And so I'm w wondering if, there, if you think that there's a way that f current figurative work could extend beyond, I don't know, I guess, I'm f I guess what I'm saying is I'm a little bit uncomfortable with just saying that all of current figurative art you know, has to be within the realm of pleasurable in terms of uh, how it's been made. Or maybe I'm misunderstanding how you're... was just in the news, right? I mean, he's, he's definitely a contemporary figurative artist, although he's painting in a style that's 150, 200 years old very well. Uh, so I think there, you know, there are all kinds of artists and they're all finding a different, different place in art history or a different set of people to draw on. Um, so I, I, again, I, I think, as John said, I think the figure never goes away. It's just that they're there and, and um, as this is, as is visible here, and, um, and of course, you know, uh, again, we all have our own individual tastes as to, to what kind of, um, what we expect from an artwork. Uh, for example, uh, I mean, this has nothing to do with the figure, but the, uh, the photos of the Beckers are in absolutely scientifically neutral in their, in their affect, and yet I find them wonderful. Uh, where, and, but, you know, not in the way I would find a Lucian Freud painting, of course. Right, um, and I think that in some ways it, it's possible there's a conflation of a couple of the different things I said, one of which was about painting and pleasure, and the other about figuration and, you know, basically I think you've made the, use the adjective visceral, which I think is a great way of doing it. It's not what I originally came up with, but it's probably better than what I originally said. Um, but, you know, uh, that there's a sense of, um, there is, of course, disturbing painting, uh, don't get me wrong, but the, um, there, the, the thing about making a painting, I mean, if you look at, for example, those Janine Ottingers in the corner, um, there's something about her work that I love, which is that it's so awkward. It really feels uncomfortable, particularly that picture of the jury, right? Um, and, and yet, there's still like a sense of delight in the way she's rendering all those uh, you know, awful looking faces, right? Um, and, and just how you can make 12 of them look different and the same at the same time. and. Um, there's there's something fun going on there, um, but it is you know in the end a kind of a, a picture of alienation um, and one which I think in terms of its composition really goes well in an exhibition related to David Park right um, because she's sort of stacking it up in particular ways um, and, and pushing your your sensation um, by virtue of the way in which it's composed. But so it's not that it's not conceptual. It's not that it's not um, thought out. Um, uh, or even alienating as a as an object, but there's still some um, some sense of uh, being able to create and experiment and play with this medium, which has so many different ca capacities that even though people have been using it since Van Eyck, uh, we keep discovering new ways to use it. It's just incredible. I'm interested in influence and ambition, and how. Ambitious was David Park. And um, just the reference I want to make is to Pollock, which you haven't mentioned. And there was um, obviously he, I, I believe he started with Thomas Hart Benton at the Art, Insti it, um, Art, um, Art Students League in New York, seeking a kind of landscape in his own work, Jackson Pollock's own work, uh, um, a kind of expressive landscape. There's something very iconic and forever about that. And I don't know if David Park, he was certainly of his time, but how ambitious was he to, to make art that was gonna last, that was gonna have impact? That's a tough one. Um, I, I will pick it up though, because I had this wonderful experience or this wonderful opportunity, I guess you'd say. When I was at SF MoMA, um, Janet Bishop was starting the planning for a David Park retrospective, which unfortunately has not yet come to pass. I don't, I don't think it's impossible, but it's not yet come to pass. Um, but at the time, 
she tasked me with uh, assembling all the David Park images and filling the computer banks, which was one of the most boring things I ever did. But um, I had the opportunity, on the other hand, to go interview um, former students and other people who knew him, um, as well as his daughters, about him. Um, and, and from those interviews, particularly with his daughters, um, I was able to glean a little bit of a sense of uh, who the guy was, uh, albeit, you know, more than a generation removed. And it did seem like um, ambition wasn't his thing. Um, yes, uh, he wanted his painting to be seen, and indeed, in the very fraught context in which he was showing it, um, at the San Francisco, um, you know, artists, um, Artist Coalition, SFAC, right, which um, uh, was being held, you know, an, as an annual exhibition, um, uh, showing his work, sending his work in and wondering whether it would be accepted or not. This was a big deal for him. Um, but basically, he was just somebody who wanted to paint. Um, as far as I can tell, that was his thing. He wanted to paint. Um, and it really didn't matter um, if he could make a lot of money, um, if a lot of critics wrote about it, um, if everybody loved him for it, he was just going to keep painting anyway. Um, he loved playing music too, but painting really was his thing. Um, and, and so he's, he's this interesting figure. You see a lot of musical images in his painting, but nevertheless, Painting is what he did for work. He got up, he worked in the studio every day, according to his daughters, right? Um, they could come in, he would, he would not ignore them, but he was painting. That was his work, he was doing it, and that was where, that's the way it went. So um, in that sense, he seems like um, someone who really didn't worry so much about history, um, or, you know, which is so much about what our ambition is in some sense. Like, I want to live beyond this. I want this to be remembered, or whatever. Um, uh, and it, I don't think that he had had that in that sense. I, I'd just like to add, I'll pass it to you in a moment, <laughs> just like to add that um, we have seen a huge change in what it means to have an art career. The idea of people didn't talk about it in those terms, didn't have, have those expectations. Uh, really, um, they made a change at the um, College of Fine Arts. Um, so that people could get master's degrees without having a bachelor's degree so that artists could teach. I mean, they were making all kinds of accommodations because, you know, teaching was a way of surviving. And the expectation for decades, you know, centuries, but for the most part, was just not what um, young artists coming out of art school with an MFA expect. So, um, you know, I just wanted to add that. Oh yeah, there's there's definitely been a change in in the role of well the way that people see a life in the arts in the past forty years, fifty years. Uh, I, I mean, I think that the Warhol's statement that art is a business like or job like any other job has been massively influential, with some good results and some bad results. Uh, Park was from a, a different generation. They, they these people these who grew up in the forties and and fifties had no expectation of making uh, a career, well, they began to, but uh, originally they had no expectation of, of having a, a, a career or, or making it a job. It was, it was indeed seen as a kind of uh, voluntary priesthood. Uh, and of course, the Park's kid's nickname for him was Old, old Painthead. So I think that, that says something about, about his dedication and his enjoyment of just being in the studio, pursuing his vision. I, I mean, um, the point that he worked the graveyard shift so that he could paint during the day is a sign that um, that was the most important thing. So, uh, and, and he was always showing and always concerned about the work getting out. He um, participated in the annuals here as well. We had annuals here in the 50s, and he participated in the, a number of those, along with Deep and Corn. And, um, and I think, you know, there's no one makes work hoping, I mean, with the idea that it's not going to matter to someone somewhere. It just. Um, you know, he, he was generous. He gave artwork to his friends. Um, we have some work here that has been loaned by um, the two daughters of Charles Cushing, the composer who was a close friend, and um, Jennifer. 
talked about her parents coming home at night and seeing something by the door wrapped in newspaper. And it was a portrait that he did of Picat and just left for her. And that's what we hope to show in terms of this exhibition, just how um, wonderful he was as a man and um, how important his friends were to him and giving and sharing he was generous. The question was, the question was, was, was the fire, the fire of 1923? Which fire? No, David Park. David Park. When he destroyed his work. Oh, when, when he destroyed his work? When he drove it to the dump? Is that what you're asking about? When he gathered up all of his, um, his abstract work that he had in the studio in his home and he loaded it into his truck and um, he and his wife, Dee Dee, drove to the Berkeley dump and got rid of it. So there, there are some pieces that had already gone out into the world that had been purchased, that had been given as gifts. So there are some very few abstract paintings. Um, but essentially, he destroyed everything. I have a question. Um, you talk a lot about uh, schools and movements that dominated the 50 years of the last 20th century. In the last turn of the century, since the turn of the century, are there movements and schools going on? Is that era gone? And is that attributed to why you have concerns what's going on in art of today? Um, well, I got us into that, I guess. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, um, generally uh, speaking, and this was even true when I studied uh, modern and contemporary, or, or when I studied contemporary art history in the 1980s, right? Um, there was, it was being taught to me then that once we hit the pluralist era in the 1970s, then we started to um, lose a sense of the avant-garde having its own self-conscious mission, right? Something about postmodernism trips up our notion of historical progress, right? So that we now no longer can maybe believe that there is this group of artists who's ahead of society and that they are the ones who are going to take us, take the art world forward um, and that the, the artists that are, you know, working today will be learning from them in order to move that into the next generation or whatever. Um, and so now we see lots of different things happening all over. And, and this has, of course, been exacerbated by globalization. So that now we have access to, you know, Chinese contemporary art, uh, Indian contemporary art, Middle Eastern contemporary art, Latin American contemporary art, right? And, and so there's a kind of flavor of the month thing going on. So when I was at the last Documenta, it was right after the Arab Spring, and so there was a ton of art from the Middle East, North Africa, um, all these artists you'd never heard of, and that's very exciting. Um, but, you know, one, one would be hard-pressed to figure out what you know, what their art constitutes progress over and above, right? Um, if not to say the political situation that they've all sort of endured over the last couple of years by that point, right? So in, in some sense, it, we, we, we lose that sense of um, time and instead it's replaced with a sense of space, right? That's how I would best describe it, is that instead now we have artists operating in different, um, uh, almost cells around the world, and that those cells now have a lot of contact with each other, partially because of, you know, residencies which have expanded considerably, but also art fairs, biennials, all these different international um, exhibitions that are happening beyond the things that are happening at museums that allow artists to see each other, to learn from each other, to copy each other, and to grow as artists. And so in that way, we're really, in some sense, lost in terms of what's next. <laughs> I would say also that <clears throat> um, digital technology is having and will have an, an amazing effect on the art world. This is the new, this is the new photography. Uh, it is the new uh, lingua franca. This is the new base language that all artists are going to be dealing with. Oh, let's say 90, 95% anyway. I think um, we have reached the end of our program, uh, certainly the formal part. Thank you all for joining us. We have coffee and refreshments, and if you'd like to help yourself and, and have a chance to um, chat with our speakers, thank you again so much. Um, 
And we have a concert coming up. We're very excited that the Del Sol String Quartet will be here on Saturday, May 7th. It will be 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You are all welcome to join us. We've been... Um, really privileged to have them come in when we had our David Park, excuse me, when we had our Demon Corn show and our Mildred Howard show, and to have them come in for David Park is really going to be extraordinary, and we're looking forward to these fabulous musicians. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you. <laughs>